No spoilers! Spoiler. Ah, no spoilers! Spoiler. Ah. My first time playing The Surge did not leave me in a very good mood. The game hadn't been out for very long when I played it, and it was about as stable as a billionaire's submarine. I had constant frame rate issues, the game crashed on more than one occasion, I clipped out of the levels more than once, and ultimately I got sick of everything before even making it to the second boss. It's a shame, because there were some elements present that I really enjoyed, but because the game was in the state that it was in, I couldn't really get to a stage where I was actively enjoying myself. I'm not sure if other people experienced these issues, I vaguely remember someone I used to talk to saying something about crashes, but I don't recall the specifics of their comments because they were wearing a t-shirt with a cool frog on it and that's all I could focus on. Christ, I don't think I ever learned their name. Ron Swanson would be proud. The Surge wasn't a good game to me, but I do confess it wasn't just the technical issues that killed it for me, it was also the fact that I was still relatively new to the Souls-like, with Dark Souls 3 being my only exposure by this point, so I wasn't used to dealing with all the tricks and traps that these kind of games employ. It's safe to say that I am now much more comfortable with Souls-likes, having played a ton of them, ranging from Borderline Master pieces to piles of old cum and I feel like I'm in a much better surge to give the surge a surge a surge 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 Surge. Can't stop saying Surge. I feel more like I can give the Surge a real go, that's what I was desperately trying to say just then. A few days ago I was browsing my PlayStation library for something to play during a depressive episode, and as fate would have it, I felt like the Surge was the way to go. I'm not certain why this was the case, maybe I expected to hate it again and at least that way I'd have something material to ascribe my low mood to, cause that's a healthy thing, but that isn't what happened. The surprising thing was that several hours had passed and I was actually enjoying myself with the game. Not only has it not crashed yet, but it also runs a lot smoother, I've had no noticeable frame rate drops or clipping issues, and as a result, I've been able to enjoy the core experience of the game quite a lot. Although I do kind of find this warning the game gives you upon boot up kind of amusing. Hey, look at that, my PS5 actually came dangerously close to justifying its own existence for a minute there. It was the only game I wanted to keep playing for hours on end, hell it was the only activity I could focus on for several days. So I figured it would be a good subject for a review, this will also give me an excuse to replay The Surge 2 later for a review of that, because I need to stop reviewing the sequels before I do the original games. It's just uncivilised, isn't it? So let's have a look at The Surge, a game I went from dismissive of to enjoying, then all the way back into hatred again by the end. Oh. We've already established that The Surge is a Souls-like, and just in case you need a refresher, these games are typically designed to be challenging with combat based around one-on-one -on -one fights and stamina management, usually with interconnected environments and hitboxes that are taking the absolute piss. The Surge's claim to fame is that it does all of this in a sci-fi setting, which made me interested enough to buy it in the first place, but what does this setting do for the experience? Well, let's look at the way the game treats gear and equipment first, because that's the best place to start. The main thing about your character is that we've been welded into this rig that boosts his strength and movement whilst allowing him to withstand some punishment, giggity. This rig is what we spend the game upgrading, since unlike your typical Souls-like, you cannot level up specific stats. Instead, when you level up, it increases your rig's power core, which in turn affects what abilities and armor you can equip. It makes a certain sense. If you want to wear a full set of the specialized security armor, then you would need to make sure that your core can put out enough juice to run it. This also makes sense for the abilities or injectables, because you'd reasonably need power to activate or sustain them. This is an interesting enough take, and it makes a certain sense within the sci-fi setting, and I'd even go so far as to say that the inability to level up specific traits also does make some sense. The rigs themselves are supposed to be general purpose. The pieces of gear they can equip is the main determining factor at how they perform at any given task. If you need to be quick, you need to equip something lighter. If you need to resist toxic material, then you need to equip something shielded. If you need to be sturdy, then you need to equip the heavy, bulky stuff. Again, there is a logical through line here. It's an interesting take on the usual mechanics. I also sort of like how we go about acquiring new gear, or rather I like the concept. In combat, when you lock onto an enemy, you can target specific body parts, either aiming for the soft spots to quicken their demise or the armored bits to unlock the schematics for the gear they're using. When you fight them, you build up energy, and when you have enough energy, you can perform a finishing move that cuts off the targeted body part and nets you the schematics for the armor worn on that part or their equipped weapon. You then take the broken stuff to a crafting station and fix it up so you can use it. Now, this is a fair application of a crafting system, and I will say for the early game where we're exploring the ruined facilities, it makes sense that we need to improvise to get better gear. But the issue comes with the long-term application of 
this mechanic. If you want newer, better gear, then you have to be constantly targeting enemy armor, which makes the fight take a lot longer, and it usually staggers them far less so they can attack you far more. And even then, if you accidentally target the wrong bit and try to finish off by cutting your initial target, there's a big chance that the cut will fail and you won't get the parts you need. It also doesn't help that as the game goes on, the armor you can get from enemies does that annoying video game thing where it's only about 1% as effective when it's worn on you. These security dudes here can take a hell of a pounding, but if you go through the effort of chopping them up, building their armor, upgrading it as high as you can with the parts you've been painstakingly grinding, and you have a core that generates enough power to use it all, then you'll find that these dudes who could already kill you in two hits can now kill you in still two hits, maybe two in a bit if you're lucky. You can of course make use of implants, like the ones that boost your maximum health to try and mitigate this, but I still feel like this sort of misses the point of armor. I was willing to forgive the early sets that we got because they weren't designed for the stresses of frequent combat, but the thing is, this security armor is and therefore should do more. As I say, I built and upgraded it as far as I could at the time, and it was still nearly useless as far as protection went. I did like that it reduced our stamina consumption, but I feel like it should have been more protective, you know? One other neat thing it does do though is it reduces the energy you need to use your personal drone that you unlock early on in the game. The drone can be equipped with a variety of tools like laser guns, shields, or a freezing aura that can slow your enemies down, and you need to hit a certain level of energy before you can unleash it, so the security armor lowering the cost is handy, even if the armor itself is no more effective than a cardboard box. Staying on the drone for a minute, one neat detail is that if you're not in combat and you have some energy, you can press the drone button which charges it and makes it ready to be quickly deployed later without you needing to get some hits in first. See, energy builds up as you fight enemies and it decays between encounters, so being able to get the drone ready is mighty handy. If you leave it with its basic laser gun, then you can cast it without energy, but it will only do like one point of damage to the enemy that you're targeting, but then again, it can serve as a useful way to lure enemies away from one another, so I don't really mind this. You really don't want to pull more than one enemy at a time here. This takes the Souls-like design philosophy of having the player need to be slow and steady and cranks it up to 11. Areas aren't huge, but they're bursting with enemy groups, and the system really isn't designed to handle fighting any more than one foe at any given time. It's very frustrating to have to handle more than one enemy at a time, because half the time enemies can lunge from an idle position to a full speed strike, and you can't take that many hits before you're killed, so you need to tread very, very carefully. Of course you can just leg it past them, and most enemies will get bored and stop chasing you really quickly, and you might need to do this from time to time if, say, you had the misfortune to die, and you're now heading back to where you perished to reclaim your lost currency, because this is a Souls-like, only now you need to get there within 2 minutes and 30 seconds or it's gone forever. I hate this design choice. There are no two ways about it, it's a fucking dreadful addition to the already questionable element of the formula, and it just makes your next life all the more tense because now you need to hurry or lose your scrap forever. What's odd is when you access the checkpoints, which take the form of these operations units, you can store your currency here so that you aren't carrying it all around and you can grind more safely. So one half of the game wanted to be more forgiving, and the other half wanted to be such a massive dickhead that it could be seen from orbit. For Souls likes, I've come to realise that I've never been a huge fan of the whole dropping currency thing in practice. The punishment for dying in these games is already the fact that you now need to re-navigate the world and all of the enemies are back, so robbing you blind each time feels a bit malicious, but at least most Souls likes don't make this a timed event. At least most of the time I could just leg it past the enemies to grab it, but in later areas we're expected to duck and weave through tight corridors patrolled by robots with laser arms and contend with dudes who never stop chasing us and who will keep getting back up after death even when they've been decapitated and it just makes the whole situation all the more irritating. At least the environments include multiple shortcuts and paths that duck past some of the more annoying groups and in general the level layouts have that open-endedness and verticality that I really like, although I have to confess exploring the facility isn't much fun because it all looks… well very boring. The visual style goes for that more realistic take on sci-fi where it looks like the things here could exist in the near future, which just leaves us exploring environments that look really generic and fighting enemies that don't look all that special. Generic really is a good word for the game's overall presentation. Credit where it's due, there is a lot of detail in the environments and enemy designs, but with a couple of exceptions, there really isn't anything eye-catching about where we are or who we're fighting. Not that I can think of any of those exceptions off the top of my head, but you know, I'm pretty sure some exist. As I played more and more, I was also reminded of the other problems I had with my previous attempts that were not the result of technical issues, but rather of terrible design choices. The hitboxes in this game are fucked. Attacks that should clearly not hit you still manage to land, and given how brittle your dude is, taking one or two hits too soon mean you might as well just backtrack to the safe zone, rest up and try again, which can be really fucking tedious. You also can't really upgrade your primary healing tool, instead you find duplicates of it or higher ranked versions that you can use in your implant slots. At least you can stack those so you can have a total of 12 healing items at a time without handicapping myself too much elsewhere, so long as my core can handle it. 
Still, it's hardly brilliant design. It feels very lazy if you ask me. I do like that as you fight you'll sometimes regenerate some of your injectable uses, but the issue is that this mechanic feels really inconsistent and unreliable. Some levels include stations that refill your health and injectables, but usually they're followed by an area mobbed with enemies, so rather than designing the encounter to be organically challenging, the devs just stuck a healing box here so you can tank all the pain they're gonna put you through. One area had the station appear relatively soon after I first entered, only for me to enter a courtyard filled with quick melee attackers, heavy hitters and annoying jumpy robots. I did soon discover that the robots were easily dealt with by blocking their attacks just before they land and countering, but even then it took ages to kill because they had so much health. I had been upgrading my rig and weapons, but these bastards just wouldn't die in any less than a dozen hits. I did debate switching to a slow but heavier weapon to do more damage, but the payoff wouldn't have been worth it because the slow weapons in this game just don't hit hard enough to justify their use over something faster. Something else annoying is the ability to see enemy HP bars is only available with an implant, which means you have to sacrifice a slot for it, and this can fuck off. Most Souls-like games by default allow you to see enemy health bars because it really doesn't warrant being an unlockable skill. We can suspend our disbelief enough to accept that we can see enemy health bars without needing an in-universe reason for it, that's all I'm saying. It's also barely a justification that this is a high-tech implant because without it we can still see boss health bars. Speaking of bosses, they're shit. So far, I've fought four of the game's five bosses, and only the second one that I battled was a genuinely entertaining fight. The very first boss you fight is this big clumsy walker. You beat it by attacking the legs until it falls over, then wailing on the head whilst it's on the ground and vulnerable, and its attacks are so ludicrously easy to dodge that it's just not challenging to fight. I died once because I accidentally dodged the wrong way. The second boss, the firebug, was alright. It flies around and you need to break off its arms to weaken it enough so you can force it to expose its head so you can do some real damage. I just enjoyed this fight. I fought this fight was absolutely fine. Then we come to the big sister, which has six separate arms that you'll need to destroy before you can target the head, and this is just so fucking tedious. The first two arms aren't so bad, but the next four all have welding flames which can deal a large amount of damage and can't really be blocked. You don't need to destroy them to win the fight, but they'll beat on you relentlessly if you don't, so they may as well be mandatory. The fourth boss is where I quit playing. It's not because he's particularly difficult, he does hit hard, but his attacks are easy enough to dodge and once you discover that if you remain at mid range he won't use his devastating ranged attack so you won't be caught out, all you have to do is hit him once, pull away as he combos and then hit him again when he finishes a combo. The thing that makes this fight a massive pain in the ass is that every time he loses a few hits of health he retreats and summons a beefed up copy of the first boss who, again, isn't too hard but the melee attacks it can do have such ludicrous hitboxes that I kept getting hit by attacks that looked like like they completely missed me. I gave up after the fourth attempt when I killed the robot he summoned and then damaged him only to see he was summoning another robot and that robot killed me with those melee attacks that didn't fucking touch me. When talking about boss design and games in general there will always be an element which is inherently subjective and that's the relative difficulty of the experience of facing off against them. When I reflect on the surge I'm not left thinking that it's a hard video game that would imply some level of competence on the developers part and I'm not willing to give them the benefit of that doubt here. It's just a cheap game. It's a game that gets annoying really quickly and never really settles into a good groove. Its few interesting ideas are so bogged down by irritating bollocks that it doesn't remain fun to play. I like that we can bank our tech scrap at the checkpoints, but I hate the timer that you have to contend with if you die and want to get your lost scrap back. I like that we level up our weapon proficiency just by using weapons because that feels rather organic and it tries to make the core combat more rewarding, but I hate how limited the weapon system is beyond that. There's no interesting weapon arts and you can't dual wield anything or carry a shield which limits your playstyles. I like that the checkpoints have plenty of access routes to unlock which encourages exploration, but I hate how bland the environments we're exploring are. I managed to enjoy my first few hours this time, but when I reflect I realised I wasn't really having fun after a while, I was just playing because I needed a distraction and this was there. At least it helped in one way, I wasn't depressed in the end, I was fucking annoyed. Big step up. I mean... I think it is anyway. Graphically the game's fine, though when we examine the infinitely more important art style I'm left feeling underwhelmed by its aim for a level of realism. As I said earlier, this all looks like stuff that could exist, but it has no fucking character to it. All of the robots are underwhelming to look at and are just kind of a pain to fight. The sound is also fine, the background music and general sound effects don't really warrant much in the way of praise or hate as they're just fine, they do their job and I never thought about them. The voice acting though, oof, that's a whole other situation. I have to assume that professionals were not used either that or the direction was virtually non-existent. I don't know you. I'm surrounded by dead people here. Maybe someone would like to explain what's going on. I'm sorry, I don't know. You need to get inside. Maybe you can make something to protect yourself. What the hell is this freak show? This freak show, as you call it, is my legacy and the future of human life on Earth. You failed to see, or maybe you chose not to. 
but I'm trying to save mankind here. None of the voice actors sound convincing, and the inclusion of dialogue options make the conversations feel really awkward in that uniquely video game way. That comes as a result of each line recorded only sounding right alongside the others when spoken in a very specific order that the player may not choose. I'm not a lover of cutscenes, but I think they would have been a better choice here because we're not playing as the standard voiceless pleb which you usually see in the Souls like. We're playing as a man named Warren who has a face, a voice, and some hints at a personality. He's confused and often sarcastic, or would glib be the better word? I don't know. Whatever he was aiming for, I think it fell flat. Who are you, really? Dr. Chavez. Once everyone here knew. There was one character in the whole game whose voice actor seemed to be going for it, whose name I currently can't be asked to remember, and I wouldn't even say it was a good performance, it was just kind of passable. So what do we have when it all comes together? A game that's kind of shit, really. The combat can be entertaining when the game remembers to play to its strengths, but the exploration is boring, the characters are forgettable as all fuck, the bosses are mostly uninteresting to look at, much less fight, and the main character is so lacking in personality that I wonder why they bothered to make him a character at all. The reason many Souls-likes don't strive to make the player character a fully fleshed out, well, character is because it usually works in the favour of the larger story to have them merely serve as a method for the player to interact with their worlds. Because they're not meant to be special just by virtue of being the protagonist, they become special as the player pushes onwards and sticks with them. If they do go for a real character, then they need to think about it. Let's compare it to, say, Steel Rising. This game is also a Souls-like with a named voice protagonist, but they're actually careful about how they implemented that. Aegis doesn't have much personality of her own, but then again, she's an 18th century steampunk robot, I think 18th century it might be 17th, I can't remember, so the fact that she is stilted and bland in Persona makes a lot of sense and ultimately she would have been hurt if she was too smoothed or fleshed out, because then she would lose the roughness and mechanical nature that makes her fit so naturally into this world. She can still interact with people as an automotive robot, in fact her being an old timey machine sort of makes the dialogue trees work better because I can accept that a robot like her might not know when to ask a question to keep a conversation flowing naturally. Still Rising's a fucking good game by the way, you should play it. Warren is less compelling by contrast, but really this is a discussion for the story bit. A few quick fire gameplay complaints first. The energy mechanic is kind of annoying, the crafting system becomes tedious as more and more you'll need to farm high end materials to create and upgrade gear, some death drops are completely arbitrary, and far too many areas have corrosive material spilled on the floors that the special hazard gear you can obtain does fuck all to protect against. There we go, now we can move on to the story bit. So, shall we? The story elements of the game are the weirdly more competent ones, but not in a way that, say, ties an otherwise average experience together into something great like in Darksiders, more in a way that shows the potential of something without ever truly reaching it. The Surge takes place in a future where technological development outpaced the world's social structure leading to mass unemployment and dwindling resources, though at this point we could probably just call that the modern day. We open with a narration about the future and how new technology is paving the way for the true potential of humanity over what I suspect is stock footage, before we transition to our player character Warren watching an intro movie on a train. He's on his way to Creo, a company that produces all sorts of high-tech gear, including the rigs that we'll soon be equated with, and when the ride ends, we're given movement control and we discover that our boy is wheelchair-bound, and this is one of those moments of potential that I was talking about. He doesn't say anything, but we can understand why he's come to Creo looking for work, because they produce the rigs that would not only allow him to walk again, but would just generally give him a boost to his abilities beyond mere men, and judging by the emptiness of this train, it's probably really hard to get an interview, much less be hired to this company. We then leave the train and move to have our rig installed. There is a choice between the two, but it doesn't matter. I do think it's a bit of a shame that we don't get to stick with the chair for very long. Hell, it could have been rather interesting having to survive the first area or so without a rig, or maybe just following Warren in his first day and then shit goes wrong and he needs to be rigged up, but that would have been far too creative and interesting for the Surge. Once we choose our rig, we're then treated to a disturbing sequence where Warren is awakened screaming as his new augments are implanted. The computer says he's been sedated, but clearly that failed. Another neat moment as this hints at the fact that things are already going wrong before the big cataclysm that would drive this facility to ruin has even occurred. Warren then awakens in a scrapyard and needs to fight his way to safety in his barely working rig with only a bit of pipe to serve as a weapon, unaware of what happened and for a moment seemingly alone, and even when he does meet another person via hologram, it's made clear that she knows about as much as he does about this situation. At this moment, we get a good sense of scale of the event. The person we speak to is a higher up in the company and she has no idea what's going on or why, which breeds this sense of confusion and helplessness as we're left to explore and try to figure out what's going on and piece everything together. Sadly, the story is pretty downhill from here. 
here. There is an overhanging plot about something called Project Resolve, which is meant to basically repair the damaged environment, which is thought to be unsuccessful, however it does work, only far too slowly to make a difference and humanity is still doomed to die out, and the worst of all, it emits a toxic byproduct. The follow-up project, Utopia, saw the release of microscopic robots called Nanites, which were meant to speed up the good bit of Resolve, which they did, but they also killed most of the people they came into contact with, and drove most of the survivors insane. Long story short, the Nanites became self-aware, and that's why shit hit the ventilator. It's a robot and a sci-fi thing that's self-aware, of course it's gonna doom humanity. It is a fairly interesting story, if a little unoriginal, but it's just not told very well. The characters we meet aren't interesting or memorable, and about half of what they said goes in one ear and out some other hole. It doesn't help that the voice acting just ain't up to snuff and it makes listening to the characters a chore of its own, but the plot never really feels like it's finding its groove. I had to keep looking bits up on Wikipedia as I wrote this script because I kept spacing on the narrative. It's delivered by such droning dullards that I could barely retain the information and it led to me feeling really disinterested by the time I finally quit. Sorry to Surge, you had promise narrative-wise, but clearly didn't know how to deliver on it. Maybe if you had more characters, or perhaps less characters, that just left us to pick through and piece everything together without a convenient NPC to exposit everything, then you would have at least had that Souls-like quality where we, the players, got to figure it all out at our own pace. So yeah, the story had promise and tried harder to reach its potential than the gameplay did, but even then it fell short and didn't leave me wanting to discover all of its secrets. It just made me want to put YouTube on my phone and listen to Curious Archive videos. The Surge is a bad game, there's no question. Its few good ideas and moments of potential do not make up for the bad design choices and forgettable plot that I'll give credit to, at least it tried, but it couldn't escape the fact that it was nothing special. It's weird that the sequel does it so much better. Don't get me wrong, it does have some cliche elements like the player character awakening from a coma to see the world around him is fucked, but it also does a lot of world building in those early sections and has more interesting, varied environments to explore also more fun weapons to play with. To be fair, a sequel should always strive to improve upon the original, but in The Surge's case, it's mind-boggling just how much better the second game is, although on reflection, that isn't a particularly lofty height to reach, being better than The Surge. It would be like entering a cooking contest, and your opponent serves a plate of rotten fried baby arms arranged into a swastika and covered in expired supermarket brand barbecue sauce. There's nowhere to go but up, you literally just have to make a meal that isn't that and you're a shoo -in. I left The Surge feeling actively annoyed by its bullshit, and when the dust settled and I sat down to write about it, I found that those negative feelings weren't gone. Right, so I just compared it to a plate of Nazi baby arms, obviously I'm not feeling great about it. But I was already getting a bit bored of the whole experience before I quit, and I think on some level I was looking for an excuse to abandon the subject. I don't know how it ends, I don't care how it ends. On the upside though, I can now move on to The Surge 2, a better game in pretty much every single way. My final thoughts are this game is shit. It might have had some good ideas, but it's about execution at the end of the day. The Surge fumbled so badly that it's easy to completely overlook what promise it might have had and how it could have been something amazing. At least the sequel is better and I get to go and play that now. The Surge 2 is good. We're talking about The Surge 2 next time, in case that wasn't obvious. Love you all, see you later.